Thank you very much. So it's always easy to talk about deep learning because there's a large group of people who uh, are interested in it and a large group of people who understand it. And they actually overlap quite a bit. Uh, I'm go going to talk about implications in both vision and in speech. Um, I've talked a lot about vision and deep learning over the years, but I've really gone all in in the speech area, uh, founding Babel Labs uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, and discovering as rich an environment for uh, innovation using deep learning there as has clearly been demonstrated uh, in vision. So there's plenty of hype around deep learning and AI. In fact, you know, recently I did a, a Google uh, search on AI and you get something like th three, three billion hits. So that's a, that's a unique page for everybody in the US, uh, India, and China. Um, if you looked on Crunchbase um, for artificial intelligence startups, you would find something over at this point, 15,000 startups that say they're doing AI. Um, I think in that version of the meaning of AI, it is pretty much the same meaning as the word new. Because you'd have to be an idiot not to put AI uh, into, the, uh, into the profile of your startup. But even in serious technical work, uh, the amount of real R&D work that's going on is phenomenal. If you look on archive.org, um, there are now more than 20,000 papers on neural networks, most of them published in the last 24 months. And so it's happening broadly and deeply. Um, by way of a little taxonomy, uh, people have talked about AI for the better part of the last 40 years, uh, and it covers a lot of different distinct technology elements, all of which have some rough notion of emulating the reasoning uh, processes of, of humans in some way. Uh, it includes things like theorem provers and knowledge-based systems. And within that, you have this category of machine learning, which are techniques that use uh, typically large sets of examples as a way to uh, find the parameters of a model. And within that is deep learning. And it really has been the revolution in deep learning which has powered all of AI. Uh, that These other techniques, non-deep learning techniques, have evolved continuously but relatively slowly over the last 40 years. But the explosion of research and deployed systems in deep learning um, has really been at the eye of the hurricane. So, so what is deep learning? And many of you at this point already understand this well. But for me, it is really this idea that we can construct a complex mathematical model that mimics the behavior of some even more complex but hidden system where if all you have is some of the input and output behavior of this system, that is, you can ask a person, what is, the, what is this a picture of? And they'll say, you, you know, that's a bird, that's a frog, that's, uh, you know, my dad, Harry Rowan. Uh, that is uh, the, becomes the data set that you use to create this mathematical model. And it turns out, if you have a sufficiently high dimension model, uh, you can uh, have a system which does a remarkable job on almost any kind of input to extract almost any kind of information to detect patterns or regenerate patterns of interest. So whether it's images or video sequences or voice or written language or credit card transactions or uh, uh, network attacks, all of those things uh, permit with appropriate labeling of the data to allow the training of the model to have really quite 
sophisticated systems that mimic the behavior of the hidden system. And we call it artificial intelligence because the hidden system we're typically modeling is somebody's brain. So that process of iteratively exposing the model to uh, these examples and uh, incrementally updating the coefficients of that model is the training process. And when we get done training, then we have a model which behaves in a good approximation for that specific behavior to the original hidden system. And that's what we call inference, using the model. Vision has been the area with the most broad spread impact from deep learning uh, because images are really rich, complex, ambiguous data. It's very hard to tell a programmer, here are some examples of a cat, go write an algorithm which allows you to distinguish cats from dogs. The differences are so subtle. The variety of ways, the poses, the colors, the fur, the ears are uh, so uh, varied that it's extremely difficult to write a closed form description of a dog or a cat. But given enough examples, you can build a model which does better than humans do. And so vision is one of those domains where the convergence of having lots more computing capability, uh, the cloud has given us access to the world's images so that we can create uh, huge data sets, and these algorithmic innovations have allowed us to do a great deal. And, and really, the ImageNet benchmarking challenge has been, um, I think, a, a real symbol of that progress. So this was created um, in the early part of this decade. 1.2 million images, 1,000 categories of object. Now, you think of 1,000 categories of object being reasonably simple, but 120 of those categories are different breeds of dog. So in order to get this right, you have to know that that's a Tibetan Mastiff, that's a Shih Tzu, and that's a Norwegian Elk Hound. So not something that uh, a five-year-old is going to get right, or any of us, to be frank, uh, without uh, our own training. But if you look at what happened over the, through the middle of the decade, on this benchmark was that the original systems were typically only able to get the right answer with five guesses uh, about 60, 65, 70 percent of the time. And then in uh, really in uh, starting in 2012, the first neural networks were applied and they were dramatically better. And then better ones were done the year later, and it got dramatically better again and again and again, such that the performance quickly uh, exceeded the performance of the typical human. Now, uh, Andre Karpathy at Stanford said, this isn't really fair. I mean, we're training the neural networks for thousands of hours, yet we're taking people in off the street and ask them to identify 120 breeds of dog. So he himself sat down and spent hundreds of hours training his brain in order to be a good recognizer. And he could beat the existing systems. And then another year passed, and, and he was left in the dust as well. <clears throat> so that it got to be truly superhuman performance uh, for this. So um, there are lots of questions that, that come out of this. And part of the... Uh, Part of the question is, well, now that we have uh, lots of cameras, and now that we have really good ways to analyze what's going on in all of these images, what does it mean about the computer systems we're going to build? And uh, here I use the example of security cameras, though the issue is much broader than that of just security cameras. But it illustrates, I think, some of the key dilemmas which have emerged around deep learning and AI when you have these, at least narrowly defined, superhuman 
uh, analytical capabilities. Um, one of the questions, fundamentally, is where do you do the computing? Because these are very hard computational problems. You know, NVIDIA is doing a marvelous business in selling people these very effective computing engines, largely in the cloud, to do the computing. But you have a, a lot of choices. I mean, if you think about a security camera arrangement, you could do the computing in the camera, or you could aggregate a number of cameras locally on the LAN and uh, do some sort of a vision engine there, or you could go across the wireless network to the edge of the cloud and do the computing there, or you could go all the way up to the global data centers, which is, after all, where the rest of the world's data lives and do the computing there. And each one of these uh, potential locations of computing has important trade-offs. Um, in, the, in the limit, it's clearly going to be cheapest and lowest power to process the data locally. But you have to really know what you're doing when you design that piece of silicon that goes into that particular camera. Or you could uh, take it one step away, which gives you an opportunity to do more fusion and analytics. Or you could go all the way up to the cloud, which is very flexible. It has the attractive pay-as-you-go business model. But actually computing in the cloud, if you actually look at how much energy per op and how many dollars per op, is fabulously expensive compared to what you could do with locally optimized VLSI at the edge in volume. Or perhaps this intermediate stage, this cloud edge server, will emerge along with 5G. And so you've got different economics. You have different trade-offs uh, across this spectrum. In fact, um, you would say, well, clearly it's going to be lowest latency if I do it all locally. So the system responsiveness will generally get better as I move my intelligence to the edge. On the other hand, the scope of data analysis, what do I do with this set of images versus the billions of other images coming from billions of other cameras, um, is going to be better the more global I make that computing. Um, privacy is a big deal, uh, particularly if we're capturing human activity, human speech, human movement and expression. Um, anything that goes to the cloud is inherently vulnerable to abuse. Uh, sometimes commercial abuse, sometimes uh, uh, privacy abuse, sometimes uh, misuse by governments. And so if you want to be private, think about doing the computing locally such that only the necessary information is ever transferred out of that box. And the networking costs go up as you move it there, or at least the asymptotic uh, uh, computing costs and network costs go up. If you just have to do a single operation, it may be much cheaper to do it in the cloud than to build some new piece of VLSI to do it at the edge. But these are classic trade-offs. And in fact, it's significant that most of the world's data and a growing fraction of the world's data is pixels. It's videos being shared. It's security camera footage. It's analysis coming from autonomous vehicles. It's people sharing things on Facebook. The world's data is primarily pixels. And so how this issue gets decided about where you're going to do image processing is likely to drive how the world's networks are structured full stop. But let's look also at some of the numbers. And I've, I've used this picture for a couple of years, but it still has, um, I think, some potent implications. That if you look at the world's population of people, and you look at the world's population of image sensors, assuming a three-year life, something interesting happened in the last three years or so. We had this crossover, and not just kind of a mild crossover. You had this dramatic shift where we went from a world in which image sensors were scarce, so it wasn't hard for people to look at all the photos that were taken, to watch all the video that was captured, 
to a world in which it is humanly impossible to look at all the pixels that are being captured. Either those pixels will never be seen, or they will be looked at, previewed, filtered, selected by machine in order to bring only the most salient, interesting, provocative, or important images to human eyes. And the numbers are staggering. If you just think about what the raw image capture bandwidth is of the roughly 20 billion uh, cameras we now have out there, that's 10 to the 19th raw pixels per second. And even if you compress it well using classical uh, image compression, you're still talking about order of 10 to the 17th uh, bytes per second of, of data that you are going to uh, need to move around the planet. And that exceeds the available bandwidth of all of the world's networks. Uh, and it's particularly bottlenecked as you get up towards the cloud. And so the economics of image processing are closely tied to this question of how many streams are we dealing with. And capturing the pixels is really pretty cheap. I looked a little while ago at, at Amazon for the cheapest uh, security camera, and I found uh, that I could get uh, 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 an HD resolution camera with power supply and electronics and networking and LED illumination for 14 bucks. And it, it begs the question, OK, this is what the hardware costs. What does it cost to do something with it? And so depending on what assumptions you make about whether the computing is done in the cloud or at the edge or somewhere in between, this $14 camera may have a lifetime cost measured in thousands of dollars by the time you've paid for the processing of all of those pixels. And so it certainly suggests that what happens naturally is that more and more intelligence gets close to the edge so that you don't have to send all those pixels off someplace expensive in the cloud to process them. And so this is indicative of the role of greater local intelligence, greater intelligence in general, and the likelihood that we are going to have uh, vision processing as one of the key drivers of where our flash memory, our DRAM, our processors, our computing logic is going to be consumed. And in fact, if you look across the whole semiconductor ecosystem, it is very much about the kinds of bandwidths and computing throughputs and storage capacities that are occupied more than any other single thing by these pixels. This question of intelligence, though, is not limited to pixels. Pixels, pixels are the biggest bulk contributor to you know, the, the computing challenge. But the information content is distributed across many modalities of new data. So pixels have the biggest data because pixel streams are so darn fat. But there's equally interesting information in those considerably skinnier uh, data streams associated with audio, specifically human speech. Uh, it's really the case that human speech is at the center of human culture. And so the information richness of an audio stream is arguably, in some abstract sense, as great as the information content in a video stream, and happily at much smaller bandwidth. So we can afford to uh, do all kinds of new and strange things to it. And in fact, one of the places to start in talking about speech is to look at it as a picture. So here, I've, I've got some spectrograms. A spectrogram is a picture where time is on the horizontal axis and frequency is on the vertical axis. So this is 16 kilosample data. So that's a, you know, you're essentially looking at little slices of FFT from 0 to 8 kilohertz uh, there. 
And so the top example is clean speech. Uh, and you know, as you'd expect, there are moments of silence, which are kind of green. And there are uh, the red bits are the words. And even within them, you can see the, the, the stack of yellow stripes, which are the harmonics that make up uh, the sound of speech, especially the sound of vowels. And I'll actually give you a, just a little bit of a sense in this comparison. So here's, well, <laughs> you know what speech sounds like, but. And so on. But then we say, OK, well, what does noise look like? And in this case, we've added an equal energy uh, distribution of car noise on top of that speech. And you can see that it has obliterated much of the detail. It certainly is, means that it's never quiet. And in fact, that nice harmonic structure of the individual vowels is wiped out. The sound of those consonants, the T's and the S's and the P's, which have high frequency content to them, is pretty much wiped out. And uh, intelligibility is meaningfully harder. Now, your brain is pretty good. It's gotten you know, a few years of training in separating the human speech sounds from the, uh, the other sounds. But uh, if I were to turn up the volume on the noise further, even that would be obliterated, and you could not distinguish it. So one of the grand challenges is the question, well, how do you take that middle row and reconstruct the original speech? And it turns out, just as image processing allows you to s classify and separate out different objects or patterns or structures within an image, we can do the directly analogous thing uh, with neural networks operating on, on speech. And so by applying a neural network, we almost perfectly can reconstruct uh, what, we, what that clean speech was using just the noisy speech as input. So once you have mastered this question of noise, it has rather broad implications. You can make better audio and video recordings. You can make phone calls from noisy bars, uh, and no one will know. Uh, you can do better speech recognition. You can identify who the speaker is. Everything about the, the original content and intent of that can be, uh, can be reconstructed. And so Babel Labs is a company really working on this very hard problem of dealing with speech, and in particular, dealing with speech that's be otherwise obliterated by noise. And there's plenty of opportunities, because just as there's about 20 billion cameras out there in the world now, there's about 20 billion microphones. Um, we have lots of devices delivering voice, phones, TVs, radios. Uh, we love to share speech streams, usually in the form of videos. Uh, we interact with our devices, which creates an opportunity for speech interfaces. And we still even do this old-fashioned thing called making phone calls. It's only about a quadrillion words a year uh, in, in, in phone calls today. And so we've been able to uh, really take this broad market and find a, a kind of remarkable set of, of different applications for this speech enhancement. And here's a, a, a more demanding set, a more difficult set of, of speech examples. These are three before and after uh, speech scenarios. Let's see if this works. This is all from a single microphone. Uh, 
a friend of ours who's sailing around the world solo. And remarkably, it's language independent. This is one of the most astonishing things uh, we came across. Because in the early days, we trained solely in English, because it was easy for us. Um, and then we handed it off to one of our, uh, our Chinese prospects, because they were uh, skeptical about how it was going to work in Mandarin. And they came back and said, you know, actually, we get slightly better results in Mandarin than we got it, 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 when we measure it in English. And it says that, in fact, these, these neural network algorithms are identifying the fundamental atoms of speech, the underlying structure that comes from human physiology, and the, 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 the patterns that make up the, the basic components of languages, rather than being tied to a specific vocabulary. And we've done this in, I think, 10 different languages so far. And it's really quite remarkable uh, how well and completely you can separate out speech from non-human speech and even human speech from human speech. Uh, and, it, and there's two forms that are interesting. One, if you get all that background babble, it has exactly the same frequency spectrum as uh, individual speakers' voices, of course, because it's the same content, but it's a mush. It's a puree of speech. And unlike many traditional signal processing algorithms, which are really looking at frequency bands and trying to say that you know, that is the right frequency band for human speech or the wrong frequency band, it really is able to, di to distinguish between structured human speech sound and unstructured human speech sound and remove the unstructured sound, which is that background babble. But it's also allowing us to uh, now be able to separate one speaker from another. If, that um, at the leading edge, we can now take uh, a group of several people and say, I want to hear only that one person. And from a single microphone, be able to extract that single speaker's voice from the other speakers that are of equal magnitude. So we really have um, got the tiger by the tail, I think, here. Uh, where the number of new applications that's emerging, once you can isolate speech from other speech and from noise to uh, make phone calls work better, video recording work better, speech recognition work better, is, uh, is kind of daunting. If you look inside the box, it really is, I think, three or four specific skills that we brought together here. Um, First of all, new neural network structures, better networks that have some unique properties of being able to first decompose and then regenerate the noise-free speech. But in order to train those models, uh, we've had to develop a massive data corpus uh, by building up a class of, uh, of, uh, of raw data, speech data, music data, noise data, room acoustic models, and novel algorithms to combine them to recreate authentic, uh, noisy, reverberant speech. And we've been willing to write a lot of checks to buy a lot of compute, a combination of in-house compute <clears throat> in our own sort of uh, uh, you know, GPU uh, farm, and then a lot of uh, compute from Amazon, Google, and Paperspace to train these models. And then, to make them easily deployed, optimizing these algorithms, taking these neural networks and building low latency, uh, low cost implementations so that these things run on the cloud, they run on x86 clients, they run on smartphones. Uh, and for some of the new work we're doing in speech recognition, even running down in low cost microcontrollers. In fact, there's a natural complementarity between what we're doing to go from noisy speech to clean speech with what we're doing for finite 
vocabulary speech recognition. This is an, a, an interesting subset of the larger speech recognition problem, where in fact, you know, today's speech systems that you're mostly familiar with, which might be uh, speech recognition in your car, or it's Siri on your phone, or it's Alexa in your living room, consist of part of the system, which is uh, a local keyword or wake word trigger, hey Siri, hello Alexa, and some rather large process that runs in the cloud. You know, typically has, is consuming some, some gigaflops of computing power, uh, you know, hundreds of megabytes of memory footprint, but it has big vocabulary, so it's good for those continuous speech things like shopping and web browsing. And, and really what we've discovered is that there is a, a really important new class of applications in embedded command recognition where the footprint, that is the computing resources it takes, is little more than keyword recognition. But we can recognize 100 phrases and therefore transform how you interact with everyday devices so that you can talk to your music player, your phone, your car, and all the common things can be recognized locally at almost zero cost. And most importantly, at significantly higher recognition rates than in the cloud. One of the dirty little secrets of most of the world of speech recognition is that it doesn't work when the speech stream is noisy. Uh, in fact, um, we've surveyed a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, different uh, uh, cloud-based speech recognition systems, and <clears throat> you get an idea of it. The horizontal axis is the signal-to-noise ratio, where 25 dB is pretty quiet. Zero dB, as you heard, is pretty noisy, and when it gets negative, it's almost inaudible speech. And a really good cloud-based speech recognizer will have uh, a, um, a, a word error rate curve that looks somewhat like that. Um, there are, there are some that are slightly better. There are some which are much worse uh, than this. By contrast, these small speech recognizers with finite vocabulary fundamentally have an easier problem because they don't have to figure out what you're saying uh, where it could be anything. They only have to figure out what is the most likely of the 100 commands that you're talking about. And, and so you can routinely do an order of magnitude better, which means that it becomes viable in the context of, um, the, uh, of noisy environments. So what you would use in your car, what you'd use on a train, what you're going to use in a crowd, in traffic, um, uh, where these very low word error rates are an essential part of, of comprehensibility. And, and as a result of this, you know, we can build these command recognition systems, which are actually tiny in footprint, where the model is less than 32 kilobytes, where the whole system, buffers, code, models, is maybe 128 kilobytes and runs in a milliwatt. So if there's a button battery, there's an opportunity to put speech recognition in that device. So this allows us to now put together these, uh, these uh, more sophisticated systems that build on these components of viewing speech recognition in your phone or in the cloud, being able to do command recognition, working in conjunction sometimes with the back end in the cloud for speech recognition, and a set of, of, of services that allow us to train specific models to serve up uh, specific uh, attributes and optimize the individual services around what the requirements are in the uh, end use cases. And so as a company, the, the live network engines are the, the first fundamental piece. It's a foundation for a set of, uh, of services that allow us to do speech analytics, that allow us to do customized networks, that allow us to do specialized training. For example, for command recognition, Every, you know, your, your voice controlled vacuum cleaner has different requirements in its speech recognition than your uh, speech controlled microwave oven and that's different from what you want in your music player. And being able to serve those up and customize them completely automatically 
as part of the design process uh, is now something that we're able to routinely do. So I think that's probably a, um, uh, you know, a good place to finish about Babel Labs, but I want to finish with just some thoughts on the, uh, the implications for the semiconductor space, because I think that um, many of you are involved in semiconductors here, uh, and it's worth thinking about deep learning as a fundamentally new computing model. Just as we've had procedural programming, which was a way of representing uh, a von Neumann, uh, 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 sort of a, a Turing machine uh, with a von Neumann programming model on top of it, this is really a different programming model. This is saying the specification of the system is not a sequence of steps. It's not a tape with symbols on it. It is a set of examples. And the examples, the input and output examples, specify what the behavior of the system is to be. Um, and so to exploit the new computing model, it's, it's worthwhile to understand that a, that a rather particular set of applications is especially privileged. It's those with a lot of data, those with noisy, ambiguous, but rich data like vision and speech. Um, it means that getting access to those streams is what distinguishes the haves from the have-nots in this new world. And it will imply new types of development tools in order to do this. Now this kind of uh, computing model is not mutually exclusive with traditional code. We're still going to have C and C++ and Python and Java and we're going to write applications in them, and there's a certain set of things that are good for that. But other things will be described by data sets instead, and they will coexist at every level of the hierarchy. You'll be able to look at the die photograph and say, oh, that's conventional computing and that's neural network computing. You'll be able to look at the development tools and see these two modules side by side, and you'll be able to look at the behavior of the end system and see in some nicely integrated way the combination of those, those features. One of the big issues is in fact that continuum of uh, places where that computing is going to get implemented. And it will happen in all of the places, but in a different mix for different specific use cases. Where the cloud has a natural advantage in terms of being able to deploy you know, high performance computing, ultra large memory store, uh, and uh, be used for the training, it's going to be used where you want to do inference across the aggregate data of the world. And at the edge is going to be the places where privacy, low latency, lowest power, lowest cost are paramount. And where you're going to see quite a bit of specialized hardware. Already, all of the world's high-end smartphones have significant neural network accelerators in them. Um, they are still very inconsistent in their architectures. They're still a real pain in the butt to program because this whole infrastructure is still emerging. And we've now, uh, we're now involved in porting, I think so far, three of the top five smartphone platforms for this speech enhancement. But it will gradually happen that there is significant neural network computing even in low-cost devices. But the neural networks are very diverse. If you look across just the speech processing tasks that we're doing, the, sp the speech recognition, this finite vocabulary thing, is something that's done in tens of millions of multiplies per second. But the speech enhancement turns out to be a much harder problem. Even the well-optimized implementation is tens of billions of multiplies per second. And if you think about vision applications, they will be up into the many trillions of multiplies per second. And so we're going to have this enormous diversity in the computing load, the types of applications, and therefore the underlying hardware that gets used. You know, for the command recognition, we're running on little tiny microcontrollers in a, in, in a few megahertz. And for the, the ultimate uh, uh, high-end vision, and even some of the high-end speech applications, um, it will be 
uh, very heavy doses of, of specialized compute to make those things run um, at, at speed. And so we are entering a new world, I think, where these applications, vision and speech, are having a pervasive, um, subtle, sometimes dramatic, often, impact at every level. Redefining what is hardware, what is software, what's a system, how did we define it, and the corresponding social issues associated with it. What does it mean to own your data? How are you identified? What is privacy? What is it that I care about that I want to protect? What am I willing to share in order to get a better experience in my life? Uh, so um, it's exciting times, but it's also times that deserve a lot of thought on these questions of how do we want to design our hardware to how do I want to live, uh, how do we want to live our lives in a way that uh, uh, makes things better for all of us. Thanks very much. And I, I think I've oh, been a you, good Chris. boy and left we time had, for we questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Please come up to the microphone and uh, it's helpful if you identify yourself. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we were talking earlier at lunchtime about some unique applications that you've come across, and I wonder if you could pick one of those that might be non-obvious where uh, uh, people have come to you to solve a problem. Uh, you know, the wonderful thing about having a, a technology like this is that first, it's really easy for people to understand. You know, I've spent my, my career designing new microprocessor architectures, and I was never able to describe to my mother-in-law what I did for a living. Now I can play her a little audio clip, and she says, oh, I understand what you do. Um, and so on a very broad front, people hear this and they say, oh my gosh, now I can't do X. So, um, for example, one of the things we're working on is um, on... Um, language education for children. So there are lots of people doing education technology to help in, in language development, um, but they have to make speech recognition work much better, and they have to make it work much better in the chaotic environment of a, of a classroom. And being able to strip away all that background of children's voices and the other ruckus of children is a really important part of being able to focus in on an individual child's voice in order to be able to track what they're doing in their language development. Yeah. But we're also working on police body cameras and we're working on, uh, you know, there are people who are uh, using this for lots of, of, of amateur video production. You know, bloggers and vloggers are, are really liking this. In fact, one of the things you can do in order to get a, a quick handle on it is that there, we have this available as iPhone and Android apps called uh, the Babel Labs Clear Cloud, which essentially is a great camera. So you can record video anywhere and you just hit the enhance button and all the noise goes away. So if you want to share video with somebody. Is that open to everyone now where we could post the uh, URL for that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, it's in the Play Store or the App Store, uh, Babel Labs. And uh, you get hundreds of minutes for free before we start charging you very modest amounts of money. I think we charge, you know, two cents a minute for, for cleanup once you really get addicted. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I have one very quick question. Uh, in the future, and, and embedded devices, what do you think would be the share of uh, deep neural network accelerators in terms of real estate area? Uh, what will be the share of real estate uh, for uh, neural network accelerators? I think it depends a lot on what the, the end product requirement is. So at one end of the spectrum, suppose you're building a camera chip. Uh, I would expect that a camera chip has, you know, a little bit of the video I.O., a little bit of microcontroller, a little bit of maybe video codec, and a lot of neural network acceleration. So you could easily see something where half the die area is associated with it. If you look at a smartphone chip, you know, you're probably going to see the long-term uh, coexistence of a CPU cluster, uh, a, a GPU cluster, 
a wireless DSP cluster and a neural network cluster. So what ex and, and a bunch of memory, uh, as well as lots and lots of different I.O. So that one might be 10% or less. Um, if you go to the high end in the cloud, where you have dedicated training and, and, uh, and neural network inference chips, you might go back to you know, 50, 80% being associated with deep learning. So it will be a reflection of the uh, uh, diversity of functions that that chip is used for. How about ASR? I mean, and, and in the case of ASR, what would be the, what, what's your, you know, Oh, what, what's required for ASR? As I said, speech recognition is actually not that hard a problem computationally. You know, people are building pretty decent systems in, you know, 10 gigaflops or so. They tend to be pretty memory intensive because the language model for a 10 or 20,000 word vocabulary is actually uh, pretty big. So, um, if, you know, and as I said, ironically, making the speech sound better is much harder than figuring out what is said. Uh, and so, uh, that's something which is several, you know, probably one order of magnitude more computationally intense than uh, cloud-based full continuous speech recognition. But of course, as people drop the cost of neural network computing so dramatically, and every big company and every startup has sort of said, oh my God, I know how to make this run 100 times faster. And everybody is. And so you, we've taken this one category of computing and we've dropped its cost by 100x. And the immediate impact is that all the algorithm people are going, oh my god, they're giving away computing again. I'm going to invent new algorithms that take advantage of it. I mean, if you take our speech enhancement algorithm, uh, that works out to about a million multiplies per data sample. Now, people have been doing DSP processing of one sort or another on speech streams for for many, many decades, and you sort of say, well, I'm going to do 10 or 20 or 50, uh, you know, multiplies per data sample as I get more and more complex, you know, maybe even a thousand multiplies per data sample. But the idea of doing a million multiplies was just ludicrous. But the compute is free. You know, the, this runs on the neural network processors in these smartphone chips that's intended for vision, and they typically have on the order of, you know, a trillion multiplies per second, and we're using, you know, a few tens of billions, a few tens of billions, it's nothing. So it's practically free because of the parallel computing revolution, which has been enabled by this very simple uh, mathematical model of, of deep learning. And so people have the opportunity to invent a whole new set of, of algorithms because it's so cheap to evaluate those new functions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my question is, we just had uh, Mobile Congress and 5G. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot of talk about one millisecond latency in the new ultra-connected world. Yeah. And so you just talked about a trillion computes in your phone and data. And I yeah. think the market for memory is just softened. So that means yeah. you can get five times more data for the same price at some point. Yeah. So the question is, uh, given that your data is on the local device on the edge, one-fifth the cost, like a terabyte for, I don't know, 50 bucks. And given that you are one millisecond away from a data center where the same cheap stuff is also there, does that affect your thinking? Because to me, it's yeah. good I mean, audio is not available on a single cell phone today, as you know. Yeah, right. And, and so it was certainly 5G has the promise of taking the sting out of the network access latency. Um, so, and the theoretical potential is there. Um, but the latency to the cloud, when you consider oh, not just what are the wires that you go through, but the business models you go through, the number of interfaces, still represents a stack of computation, a stack of transactions. I think, and a stack of, of latency, which will uh, 
in general, not match what you can do in a very carefully crafted system. So in closed systems, I'm sure that you can take advantage of the one millisecond. Um, and it's been interesting to look at some of the stuff that Google has done when they sort of control everything from the point of network access through the whole cloud and back. They can get to some pretty low latency numbers. But in general, if you sort of uh, just build a generic application in the cloud and you try to run some data through it, now, if you use uh, Facebook Live for uh, video streaming, you've got about 10 seconds of latency in that system. And I think it's just an accumulation of, of different pieces of software in that stack. So in practice, there's a long way to go between the typical latencies, which are a second or more, and the theoretical limit, which has gone down from maybe 100 milliseconds to a millisecond. If someone has what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, there are lots of places where low latency on a, on a channel would help enormously. And so, the, and you know, 5G is a piece of it, but all these other pieces in having low latency algorithms to do this. I mean, uh, speech recognition has significant latency. Translation has significant latency in it today, and we have to work on all those. So yeah. One more question. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, it's very impressive if when you look at the uh, noise reduction or the elimination of, of scatter and all of that. Can, we, can you maybe comment on what made you be able to solve it while it's still hot for many other companies to, to, to solve the what, same problem? What, what, what made Babel up, Babel ups, Bubble Ups uh, able to, to solve the problem compared to many others who kind of have failed so far to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, because there's no good reason why a small company should be able to solve problems that big companies can't, but they do it all the time. Um, I think that the key for us has been bringing together into very close proximity, you know, you know at the same lunch table, world-class deep learning people who knew how to design new structures of neural networks world-class speech experts that knew sort of what does noise and speech really sound like, really look like, in a deeply mathematical sense. Um, and uh, people who really understood the computing problems, who knew how to optimize that code so that you can really make it run in the smallest footprint at the, at the lowest latency. And so only when you get those people around one table do you get sort of the trade-offs at work that allow you to, to do that. 